OK. Are we ready? So I have to say, this is, um, it's an honor to be here. Uh, I'm going to have a great time talking to all of you. And I have to say that this is, uh, my lecture is going to be something a little bit different. As, as, as you gather, I'm a math professor. And I'm going to talk to you about math. And I'm going to do my very best to talk to you about some ideas that will help you experience eternity. OK, great. So as a mathematician, there's really no better way for me to talk about eternity if, unless I talk about things that are somehow infinite. So uh, I borrowed um, some ideas from a friend who is a professor at the University of Wisconsin. And I decided to call this lecture from negative infinity to infinity. And uh, let me get started. So to get started, let me say that I have an idea. And the idea that I want to share with all of you as a math professor is this, namely that math is eternal. As we know, math is often considered the, the language of science, the language of engineering. It is so fundamental to so much that we teach here at Emory University. So that will be my theme. And to begin, as a professor, I'm going to prove for you this theorem. And the theorem is that math has a long history. I love it. For the students in my classes, you know I prove theorems. This is like the most awesome proof. 1 plus 1 equals 2. And well, it's hard to be older historically than, than this. But more seriously, um, the question that I want to address because we're talking about ideas that are supposed to be eternal. And again, my theme is that math is eternal. The question I'd like to ask is, what role will math play in our future? I'll talk to you about some of the ways in which I think math will be important to my future and the applications of the work that our research team at Emory is involved in. But before I get to that, I should explain some obvious roles in which math will play an important role. So it's well known that math will help us attack global challenges. Every scientist, every engineer, everyone working in the medical sciences, the people up the street at the CDC will agree that math will help us attack global challenges. And let me give you some examples. One challenge which faces us all is the challenge of trying to live sustainably here on Earth. And mathematicians are working very seriously on this challenge, as are scientists that span all the various disciplines. Mathematicians are working to help us understand geophysical phenomena, understand climate variability, under helping us understand complex biological systems. And their math is helping us try to understand the links between human behavior and natural processes. These are all obviously very important challenges. Other challenges in which math plays an important role are, well, let me just talk about some of the images that you see on the screen here. In Switzerland, in CERN, people are, scientists are working very hard to understand the actual nature of matter. Mathematicians are working very hard to understand the dynamics of global markets. That's that other image. Mathematicians are working in the medical sciences in so many different ways, whether it's trying to model the spread of disease. And the National Security Agency is perhaps the, <laughs> probably has more mathematicians working for them than any other entity on the planet. And of course, we live in the age of the internet. And it's undeniable that math plays an important role in helping us navigate the internet, help us make computers work much more efficiently. These are all, these are all realms in which being good at math is very important. We place a high value on, on real critical thinking skills that involve theoretical ideas. Now, I have to tell you about what I do. These are not things that I do. And since this is a talk about eternal ideals, it's rather appropriate that I'm here talking, because I talk about very, very simple questions in math. Things, questions that are perhaps among the most eternal of all mathematical concepts. So believe it or not, I'm going to talk to you about adding and counting. OK. So the theorem that I want to talk about is that adding and counting, well, these are among the first ideas that mathematicians ever thought about. 
I have to prove that. And here's my proof. So this is a picture you've already seen. And of course, the concepts of adding and counting, these are the first things you learn in kindergarten when you first start manipulating numbers. And I guess my theme is, in addition to saying that math is an eternal concept, I want to tell you that there are ideas about just adding and counting that are really, really hard, that have the property that mankind really needs to come to grips with some of these hard problems, and I'll explain that to you. So what I'm going to describe to you starts out seeming to be little more than child's play. Seemingly little more than child's play. So let's play. So Matt, who is an undergraduate here at Emory, made this wonderful talk. I can't take any credit for any of the graphics. But I can take credit for the formulas that's on the f <laughs> that are on the slide here. So in terms of child's play, what you look at, what you see here on the screen is completely true. You all see that that's true. 4 is indeed 3 plus 1, which equals 2 plus 2, which equals 2 plus 1 plus 1, which equals 4 ones added together. Maybe this was a first for a TED talk that I'm actually checking that 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 is 4. But this is, as I said, a talk about basic properties. And you know, if you count the number of ways in which we added up numbers to get the number 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, you'll see that there's five of them. And so I'm going to denote that by saying that p of 4 is 5. There's five ways of adding up numbers to get 4, never mind the reorderings. Continuing with this child's play, continuing with this child's play, we can go from 4 to 5 and do the same sort of thing. We can actually write down all the ways in which you can add up numbers to get 5. Here they all are. And if you count the ways, you'll discover that there are seven ways, and so we say that p of 5 is 7. So I'm starting with child's play adding and counting. And I want to tell you a little bit about this little task, the task of adding and counting. <laughs> Maybe you don't know all of the names on the board, but I hope you know most of them. This task of adding and counting, this function that I've called for you p, has been studied by many great mathematical minds, dating to Euler, the legendary Indian mathematician Ramanujan, G. H. Hardy, perhaps the greatest analytic number theorist in the early 20th century. This is Freeman Dyson, the, the famous Freeman Dyson, who's the physicist at the Institute for Advanced Study. And of course, then there's the count. You can find problems like what I just described in ses on Sesame Street. But I have to say, all these other great minds studied that simple function, this function that I called p, the at in terms of just counting the number of ways in which we add to get individual numbers. So to give you an indication of why we might be interested, at least at the theoretical level, of studying this type of problem, let me show you some crazy numbers. So I already showed you that p of 4 is 5. There's five ways of adding up numbers to get 4. So from your seat, try to guess some of these numbers. P of 8, would you have guessed that it's 22? What if we replace 8 by 16? What do you think you would get? Would you have guessed 231? There's 231 ways of adding up numbers to get 16. What if we replace a 16 by 32? Would you have guessed 8,349? And in particular, for the other powers of 2, these are the numbers that you get. The simple task of adding and counting represents a model for a type of problem which is pretty complicated. It's actually a simple model of a problem that's almost impossible for us to really handle, by, certainly with our bare hands, but also with the help of a computer. So this is one of the reasons that uh, mathematicians have been interested in just adding and counting. It's a model of a very difficult problem. So just to emphasize, you could ask a simple question like this. How would one figure out p of 200? And totally, to totally emphasize what I mean by the nature of this problem, there is one way you could answer this question. You could count one by one. OK, you could count one by one. But despite the fact this is a conference about trying to experience eternity, <laughs> I definitely do not want to experience that kind of eternity. If you were to actually list all the ways of adding up numbers to get 200 and literally count one by one, 
you, better, you would find that that is the right answer. And you know what the reality is? You never get there. It's not the kind of eternity that we want to experience. So what is it that we've done here at Emory? Our research team at Emory in the fall uh, made quite a breakthrough. We found that there's a way of calculating these numbers without having to add and count. Finite formula, you've probably heard about it in the news. It's presently one of the uh, uh, reported on in the current issue of Scientific American. And so the theorem is something like this. We have obtained for the first time a finite formula for P of n that turns the problem of calculating P of 200, P of a million, P of any number into a short, fairly short finite calculation. You don't want to see it. But I want to stress that it is, consi we consider, we're very pleased with this, and it's kind of a major breakthrough. Does it have applications? Well, let me explain a little bit about that. One application would be, for people like me, the really way out there kind of math. And I'm sure you can imagine that I'm not going to talk about that here. But it turns out that the problem of counting, the, the problem of evaluating this function p, is of historical significance. The problem of adding and counting, count, counting these numbers, p of n, is so, has, has been so important in the history of the development of the computer that people tested computer hardware by trying to see if the computer could actually calculate, for example, p of 200 and actually get the right answer. The problem is, how do you know if you get the right answer if you don't know what answer you're supposed to be checking that against? And of course, that's where formulas like ours come into play. So um, many people in computer science have been talking to us about further applications along these lines. And we're very excited by uh, the prospects for this work as we go forward. All right. And what I also want to tell you about is, related to this work, we discovered some very, very strange patterns. One pattern I'm going to describe to you right now is very well known. And let me tell you about it. So one of the first slides today said that p of 4 is 5. There's five ways of adding up numbers to get the number 4. It turns out that if you do the same calculation for 9 and count, you'll discover that there's 30 ways of adding up numbers to get the number 9. And if you do the same calculation for 14, you'll find there's 135 ways, so on and so forth. And if you continue in, along these lines, you'll discover that starting with the number 4, for some crazy reason, for some really crazy reason, starting with the number 4, every fifth value of this function ends up being a number which is a multiple of 5. Now remember, we're just adding and counting. Certainly, we had a difficult time figuring out how to count. Despite the fact that we're still not even that good at figuring out how to count, why would it be the case that at the end of the day, all of the numbers in this very strange sequence, why should they all be multiples of five? And what would they be the implications of a statement like that? Well, what we've done is we proved that there's a real rich, intricate structure among these numbers. We've defined new fractals, and we've proven that for primes like five, this crazy sequence has this inner hidden structure, remarkably rich structure. <coughs> I won't explain the theorem to you, but I'd like to show you a famous movie. This is a movie where you're, which if you are, aren't familiar with this, this is a famous movie of the dyna dynamical process related to the Mandelbrot set, perhaps one of the most famous dynamical systems. And what I want you to see is that, well, it's a rather mesmerizing movie, but what you see is you see images, this certain very famous bizarre blob, this bizarre shape, repeating over and over again, despite the fact that you're, you're flying into the bowels of this incredibly complicated set. What we've proven is we've proven these partition numbers have exactly a property like that. Despite the fact these gr numbers grow at a rapid rate, those strange patterns like where you saw divisibility properties by 5. We've proven that that's the kind of property that holds for all the partition numbers in a very precise sense. And let me just say, just like in that movie when we're flying into this complicated, beautiful space, 
we've discovered special walks among the partition numbers which resemble exactly that phenomenon. And in particular, on these walks, we find that these numbers are repeatedly divisible by whichever primes you'd like. Now, I won't explain what the precise statement of this result is, except to say that you should all care about what we just found. <laughs> and the reason that that is, is that perhaps the most important application that you're all taking advantage of today, this morning, tonight, and when you go home, has to do with the role that number theory plays in cryptography. The internet is based on the, the, the security of the internet is based on the principle that there are some mathematical problems that are just very, very difficult to solve. You've probably heard about factoring algorithms, primality tests, so on and so forth. And it turns out that our discovery of the divisibility patterns of those numbers has, has some pretty important applications. In particular, it wasn't, it's, it's, and in fact, it's still somewhat true that um, people believe that these numbers are very good prototypes for random numbers. And uh, well, I think everything we just said says that's probably a very bad thing to do. All right, so there are, I don't have time to explain that in great detail, except to say that sometimes very, very difficult math problems can be solved, and it does actually end, end up resulting in dramatic changes in how we end up doing things. OK. So in any event, the theme was to experience eternity. My theme is that, well, math is eternal. I think you all know that. You hear that math is the language of science and engineering and so on and so forth. Ideas, both new and old, will, of course, will help us shape our future, help us understand the world in which we live. For me, as a theoretical mathematician, the idea of eternity is a very easy thing for me to, to come to grips with, because I work on some of the oldest problems. As an ancient number theorist, I work on ancient problems, and I talk, and I actually think quite a bit about adding and counting, and uh, that's what I wanted to talk about today. Thank you.